Well, I'll try and uh, hopefully I'll be interesting. Um, uh, thanks for coming. I know it's it's hard the last uh, few hours of of a couple of long days. It's like uh, drinking from a fire hose, right? There's so much information, and uh, and I've got got some more information for you today. Um, my name is Spencer Gibb. Uh, I work for Pivotal on Spring Cloud. Uh, I'm the co-lead of the Spring Cloud core projects. So those are not Spring Cloud Stream, not Spring Cloud Dataflow projects. Um, today I'm going to be talking about Spring Cloud Gateway. Uh, we'll compare it a little bit with uh, Zool, and we'll kind of do it in a story um, today. There are no slides, so this is, this is the slide. Uh, so hopefully, so how many of you went to Josh's, one of Josh's talks today? Okay, most of the room. So I'm not Josh. <laughs> I don't, I can't code like he does live, right? I don't do this full time like he does either. Um, so I'm an engineer, so, so hopefully I do my best and, uh, you know, only make one or two mistakes while, while we're doing this. So what we're going to do is take a, an existing monolithic application and break it up. And we're going to use the Spring Cloud Gateway to do that. So uh, first of all, just to give you a little background, um, I had to write a monolith. Please tell me if you can't see everything. Um, our monolith is a standard Spring Boot application because, you know, Spring Boot, I, I work for Pivotal. It, it's a fortune teller, right? So the, the money-making feature of this application is people pay for their fortunes, all right? And uh, so here are a couple of, of endpoints that we have, one that tells you a fortune, one that says hello, um, here's our database of fortunes, nice static list. Uh, I was super proud of myself when I wrote this because you know, I'm, I'm a, I've been fortunate, I guess, to have, have been in the Java space since the late 90s, right? So I'm, I've been doing this for a while, and, uh, but I wrote JavaScript, so I was super proud of myself that I, I wrote some JavaScript to, to run our application. So Let's uh, go ahead and run that, just so you can get an idea of the application that we're, we're dealing with. Let's see. By the way, here's the, the actual repository of the, the, the code that we'll, we'll be working on today. If I go to localhost 8081, beautiful, right, UI, right? So. So hello, right? So, so this is our application. It's beautiful. Um, people might call this a legacy application. I prefer heritage, right? This thing is the thing that makes your company money, right? The, the new microservice architecture doesn't make your company any money, right? It's, it's not above the value line, but it's, it's these things that, that make your company money. So, so here we go. Let's get started. So the first thing that we want to do, so typically in a microservice architecture, You've got all these services that are located everywhere, but you still generally have one entry point, right? Whether it's a web app in our case, a mobile device, a set-top you know, application, something, and your application needs to reach code that lives somewhere in the cloud, right? So uh, an API gateway is generally uh, one of the ways that we use to provide access to our application. So what I'm going to do first is create a gateway that simply fronts our existing monolith, right? I'm just going to put a proxy in front that just ships everything over as the first step in our, in our journey. Um, now, I'm not going to go through all the pain, or the, that's not pain, I'm sorry. The, uh, everyone you know, knows about start.spring.io, right? The second, uh, Josh's second favorite place on the internet. Where's the first? Anyone tell me the favorite place? Production, yes. Production is the favorite place. Start is the second. And I'm wearing my uh, homage to Josh's uh, motto, right? Make jar, not war. Okay, so 
I made all these projects ahead of time just so that we, we didn't have to go through the boilerplate of making the projects, but they are empty, and uh, we'll see the actual relevant bits here. So for our gateway, just a simple Spring Boot application to begin with. You don't have to worry about those other things yet. So what I'm going to do is create a bean um, type route locator. This is a, a special bean that, that the gateway understands to provide definitions of routes for, uh, for it to route to. So, so my route locator, we are going to inject a route locator builder. So this is, there are a number of ways you can configure the gateway, this Java DSL being one of them. Uh, if you were in Josh's talk in the auditorium, he showed you a snippet of the Kotlin DSL. Uh, you can also use YAML property files, or um, there's also a, a repository interface that you can implement. So you could store your uh, route configurations, you know, if you want to lose them in MongoDB. So we're going to create a route. Uh, we're going to call it monolith because I, I'm bad at naming things. And we get our route. And what defines a route are two things, the predicates that are associated with it, the things that match from the request, and the filters that are applied to it. So in this particular case, we're just, we want to match everything, right? So any request we get, we are going to send to our monolith, which is currently running at localhost 8081, right? Does that make sense? So given the path of the requests, we are just going to forward anything that matches, so everything, um, on. So there are other types of things that we could match on. such as the host or any particular header. Basically, anything that you have access to in the request, you can match on, right? So if, if who here has used the Zool from Spring Cloud before? Oh, boy. So I apologize. Um, uh, and it's very difficult in, in the implementation of Zool we did to match on something other than the path, correct? So in, in lots of applications, they match on host name, for example, which is, which is a great thing that we can do here. So, but for, for now, we're just going to match on path. So let's go ahead, start our gateway application. And now here, I'm just going to simply change the port to 8080, which is where our gateway is. And Josh. So, so we're simply fronting it, okay? So super simple. So now let's start migrating some of the other parts of the application, right? So we did, we did stage one and stage two. So now we're going to move the UI. So let's grab all of our static bits and oh, let's delete those first. It's under refactor, isn't it? And then paste. Oh, dear. Awesome. Do you know what happened? <laughs> it deleted both of them. All right. Yeah, so let's see happen to have this open here. I don't want to reset it because there I didn't commit everything. See, live coding, isn't that awesome? I didn't, it's, there we go, oh yeah. I thought I had done that, but it didn't. Perfect, thank you. So I guess we won't quite 
We'll go one by one. How's that? All right. Almost there. Almost there. Perfect. All right. See, crowd programming is awesome. So now we need to, we have our, our UI application that we need to start. So this just takes advantage of uh, Spring Boot's auto configuration of static resources. So it's just going to simply host this. This way your UI team could iterate on its own and not have be constrained by the rest of the team, right? That's one of the major reasons for microservices, right? To enable your organizational structure so that they can they can have their own velocity instead of being dependent on, on everyone else. So our UI is up and running. So back to our gateway. So for this, we need a new route. Call this UI. So for this one, uh, I'm going to get a little fancy, right? Slash CSS slash star. These are ant paths. Um, so one of the things that you can't do in the YAML configuration is our custom uh, Boolean logic, right? So here we can say, or I want to match on slash JS. Or let's see. I can't remember what our I changed this or not. I did. Okay. So or we want to match slash. Okay. And our UI is running on port 8082. So one of the things about this is that these routes are checked in the order of their uh, definition here. So the route UI, if it matches, will match before the monolith. Okay. So even though we match slash, right, everything else will pass drop through um, since we didn't add the, uh, the globbing there at the end. All right, so let's restart our gateway. So let's see, one of the things I wanted to do was let's just capitalize that for fun so we can see that the gateway really pointing to our new code, not the old code. So our UI is now being proxied appropriately um, to uh, a new service. So now we've started our slicing, right? We started slicing off. Slicing off um, the bits, and it still works. So you'll notice that uh, in our route definition, we've, we're currently using hard-coded URLs, right? That's not very uh, scalable, right? We want to add another instance of the UI. So let's go ahead. So this is um, our step four here. We're going to add service discovery. So one of those things that I told you to ignore in the beginning was this uh, annotation. This enables uh, service discovery. I also have uh, on in the palm of both the gateway and all our new microservices the uh, Netflix uh, Eureka client starter. So this is the Eureka service registry from Netflix. Also in the gateway is ribbon, and I'll explain what that is for in just one second. So to change that, another thing that uh, I already have running here is a Eureka console. 
So Eureka has already been running, and in the background, certain things have already been registered, and you can see here that the UI service is already registered in, in Eureka. So let's go ahead and change this to a custom URI that is prefixed with the scheme LB, which stands for load balancer, or load balanced. And in this case, that's what Ribbon is. Rib Ribbon is a client-side load balancer, and it will use its integration with Eureka to say, hey, give me a list of all known uh, instances of the service I want, which the name is UI, right? So, right, this name, UI. And where that is defined, so if we go to the UI application properties here, right, by default, Spring Cloud says use the spring.application.name as the service ID that you register with service registration and discovery. So we change this as such, restart our gateway. Again, some of these demos are pretty boring, right? So I just changed a value, and, and the, the end result is it should just be the same as it was before, but it still should work. And so lots of my boring demos are pretty boring. Um, so if we come back here and refresh, since it's the UI, right, it, it still works. And I can come and show you that here in the logs, get it up a little higher for you folks in the back, that the this ugly named thing, dynamic server list load balancer, you know, it read the current list of, of servers, right, and pulled one from there. So, so we actually did use Ribbon, we did use Eureka to, to choose this, this server. Okay? So, so that was the UI. What's next? So now we're going to move simple uh, hello, our hello service, right, from our monolith. If we come back here, right, this guy. So we'll go ahead and grab him. We'll open our hello application and plug him in. So I'm going to do something that probably isn't a good idea when you migrate, but things like this might happen. Right now we have a request parameter, right? Um, so I'm basically going to change the shape of this request, right? So rather than a request parameter, I'm going to use a, a path parameter path variable in the spring world. And let's go ahead and run hello. So I have kind of contrived the situation that we have here, right? But many of you will encounter this. So how do I get, so I haven't changed the, the UI, right? The UI is still going to send a request to slash service slash hello with a request parameter. But I've changed it to slash hello path parameter, right? So we need to deal with that. So we're going to go ahead and do that here. So a new route for hello. Oh. So the original goes to slash service slash hello, right? So that's what we need to match on the path. Oh, not twice. So now what we're going to do is write custom filter. So for those of you who have used Zool in the past, how many have written a custom filter? A fair amount of you, right? This is not an easy thing to do, right? And it's not very straightforward to do. Um, the other problem with filters in the Zool world is that they are globally scoped, right? For every request, you have to decide again if you should filter this request or not, right? So in Spring Cloud Gateway, every filter is scoped to a particular route and will only be run if the route predicates match. Um, so in this case, we are going to, there's no custom filter, there's no built-in filter to do what we want. So I am going to say filter and just do a simple lambda here. And we'll get back to that in just a second. Um, and again, our URI, we'll stick with our 
load balanced uh, service discovery mechanism, right? So if I come back to, to Eureka, right, we have a new hello service there. So that's, that works. So here, let's get right into this guy. So the last, the way filters work, um, part of the reason that we decided to use, to create our own. So previously before when I've given this talk, a long time ago I said, you should never write your own API gateway, right? Someone else should. And then someone asked, well, why did you write one? <laughs> um, for those of you who are familiar with Zool, if you go look at Zool 1, it's basically a servlet that executes a few loops. I mean, that's its basic structure. It's basically empty, and we had to build functionality around it, right? So, um, so we've already done this. And a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, when after Zool 2 was announced, uh, we... I came up, I, as I was thinking about it, looking at the code, it wasn't going to be backwards compatible anyway, so it was going to break. Right? You, there was no clear upgrade path from Zool 1 to Zool 2. And I, I started looking at it. I knew that there were things coming down the pipe in Spring 5 that could be beneficial to us. And as I looked more and more and we thought more and more about it, we thought it was better to roll our own API gateway such so that the developer experience would be much better, more integrated, and more familiar with developers who are used to working in Spring. So, for example, the Exchange class you see here is the standard way to, to get the HTTP request and response in Spring WebFlux. It's the same. Um, the gateway is built on top of WebFlux. It also currently requires Netty as the runtime. So the gateway is non-blocking. And uh, this allows for certain things that could never happen in Zool 1, uh, like WebSockets, long-lived connections, like server sent events. Uh, they also are supported uh, in the gateway because of the underpinnings. Um, Zool 2 was actually just open source not long ago. The pull requests for uh, web sockets in Zool 2 was uh, recently merged a couple of days ago. Um, but I, I, I've spoken with the team at Netflix, and we, we were happily going along our, our similar paths, and um, they could certainly understand why we chose to do what we did. We would not have not had a stable thing to build on until recently, right? And we wanted to include this as soon as we could. So those are some of the reasons that uh, we will not be integrating Zool 2 into Spring Cloud. So let's start with our filter. So first of all, so the filter model in Spring Cloud is based off of the filter model from Spring. So it's a, it's a filter chain. So to end, we need to um, continue the chain, right? Con so we'll go ahead and start there just so we don't have errors. We need to get the requests, and we need to get the query parameters, and we need to get the first one, right, name. So there is our name parameter. We need to modify the request. So uh, the WebFlux implementation is, is all functional, uh, immutable. So if you want to change the request, you have to, in effect, create a new one. But there are some helper methods to help us do that. So there's a mutate method. And now we're going to set the path on this, right? So the path is no longer slash service slash hello. It is just slash hello plus the name, correct? So there is, oh. I need to, one more thing here, built. So there is our request. And now we need to change our exchange server web exchange object to use the new request. So we mutate it as well, set the request, and build. Make sense? Any questions about this? This is pretty unique, considering those of you who have written a filter before, this is pretty simple, pretty easy to understand. Um, 
those of you familiar with Zool, this is a pre-filter, right, in Zool parlance, right? They have three types, uh, pre-route and post. This would be considered a pre-filter. Anything you want to do with or to the request before it is proxied on, okay? So, restart gateway. All right. So we come back to our UI here. I see Joe sitting in the audience. Hello, Joe. So, so we continue to, to, to work. And so this request was proxied. Here you can see, uh, again, I have to prove that what I did worked, right? So it went out and, and found that and transformed the request uh, for us, okay? Awesome. So what's next? We have metadata. So now we find we're becoming more and more popular. People are paying more and more money to us. And our old monolith, right, probably deployed to some app server that we don't want to deal with anymore, can't handle, we can't scale enough. So we want to add a circuit breaker to our old uh, fortune service, right, so that we can protect our clients from blowing up and showing errors, okay? So we are going to come straight to the gateway, add a new route for fortune. If we remember the path slash service fortune. I, of course, we're just going to hard code this one to our eighty one. Okay, so now the, the fun part, right? A filter. So there are lots of different filters that come built in to uh, the gateway. Um, setting the path, for example. Spring is very good at matching things, right? And extracting pieces of paths out so that you can reuse them later. So for example, we use that same infrastructure. We'd, I didn't have to write anything so that you could set path with curly braces and a named part of that path, and you can reuse that in set path, for example. Also, um, you can use regular expressions. One of the most asked for features in our Zool implementation is to rewrite uh, to rewrite paths, um, which we have with, uh, you can use Java regular expressions and named segments in there to get values out of them. There are all sorts of, of different filters that we have. So the one we're going to use is Hystrix. Who's familiar with Hystrix? Awesome, lots of you. So a circuit breaker, right? This, when the circuit reaches certain conditions, so many errors over a certain period of time, the circuit will open and uh, won't allow downstream requests until the circuit has recovered. So we are just going to have, we're just gonna have an empty configuration for just a second. Actually, let's, We're going to set a name, the fortune circuit for now. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to provide was, if you're familiar with Hystrix, is the idea, the notion of a fallback, right? So when the circuit is open, when errors occur, I want to provide the client with something meaningful, not an exception, right, or not an error. So when you are using Hystrix in deep in the weeds in your code, a fallback is simple. It's either implementing the fallback method of, of Hystrix command or pointing it at a method if you're using the annotation, and it's just a method. It's just there. But when you're in an API gateway, how do you do that? So I wanted to provide a fallback mechanism that was simple. So settled on actually using a URI, but not, 
not just a fully qualified URI, something s simple. So one of the things that, that the gateway can do is forward the requests to a local Spring controller, right? So if you saw uh, Jurgen talk a little bit about WebFlux, right? The, the normal annotation-based model uh, works fine, and you could forward requests from the gateway to local controllers. So we are going to forward to a controller, let's see, called default fortune, okay? And that way we have a rich programming model to be able to define uh, a fallback for our fortune. So let's go ahead and, and write that. So I'll, this is already annotated with at rest controller. So at request mapping, Steve, default fortune. No yawning. Who did that? I heard it on the front row. Yesterday at about 2 o'clock, I had to stand up for my colleagues. I was on the front row. I was so embarrassed. I had to stand up and, and go out because I was so jet lagged. It was awful. So, right? Does everyone agree? If everyone can, can read that in the, oh, where'd it go? In the back. Yeah, all right, so, so what should happen is if for some reason our fortune service goes down, we will get this awesome fortune and no one will suspect anything that uh, it's just a hard-coded fortune, right? So let's go ahead and restart our gateway. Alrighty, and we're going to simulate, you know, a outage in Amazon Web Services, U.S. East region. There we go, outage simulated. So when we do this, oh, what's happening? What did I do wrong? Service Forge, maybe I missed. Ah, see, I don't know my own app. Random fortune, right? Not like the customer would ever know that or think to look in the source code to see that their fortune is actually random. <laughs> right, so didn't even reload the app, but now we're hitting the, the circuit. And uh, this time I started the circuit breaker dashboard. Woo, a little big. So let's see, I forget what port. Oh, the gateway's on 8080, right? Oh, this is not gonna work. Oh, maybe it will. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, basically, what I did not do in the gateway. Oh, I thought I did do that. See? Demos don't always work as planned. Oh, well, you won't get to see the. Hmm? Oh, I know why. This is boot two. Haha. <laughs> See, I work with this stuff every day and forget. <laughs> I can imagine regular users. There we go. So, beautiful Hysterix dashboard. And the more I hit this, the um, circuit is now open, and any requests will just do the fallback. They won't even try and hit the, the 
the other application for the back end for just a moment until it, it uh, a specific period of time elapses. Okay? So we'll go ahead and restart our monolith. All right, what's next? Did that. Let's. So we want to, how are we doing with time? We end at 420, correct? So we got 15 minutes. So let's go ahead now and move our fortune application. So I'll go ahead, grab this, paste this in here. So we're making so much money with the, uh, with our random fortune scheme that uh, we have, we want to open up an API so that people can build their own random fortune telling applications on our API, right? So we want to open up a, uh, an API for, for them to use. So let's go ahead and grab our database. Much more secure than Mongo. I say that in jest, really I do, I promise. All right, so we're going to change this to V2 Fortune, right? So a little different API. So we're going to go ahead and stand that guy up. So now we need to migrate. So for now, we're going to leave the... Um, Call this Fortune API. Let's see. Should we should we uh, mix it up here and match something different? Right. API dot fortunes dot io. Right. So our URI is now load balanced against the fortune service, right? If we come back to Eureka, so our fortune service is up. And one of the things that has been asked for quite a bit is our more enterprise services, right? Things like security, um, things like rate limiting. Um, I know I have to work with Joe on, on the security piece, but uh, Something like rate limiting is something that's been asked for quite a bit too. So we wanted to add that and I was, has anyone here tried to rate limit something? Show of hands, a number of you, okay. Rate limiting a single thread is, is actually pretty easy, right? There are libraries out there, it's really simple to do. But we're not on a single thread here, are we, right? We're in a distributed world. Likely there are n number of gateways fronting your application, at least two, and you want to rate limit and be consistent regardless of what, which instance of the gateway your users hit, right? So we need distributed rate limiting. Now that's a totally different question. So I, was, I, I did a lot of research, and about the same time I was doing the research, a company called Stripe. Um, has anyone heard of, heard of Stripe before? A few of you. This is a payments API company in the United States. So lots of online services are, their payments API actually th flows through Stripe. So they handle a lot of traffic and a lot of money. So I figured, and they're you know, pretty adamant that their stuff be up and that, that no one abuse um, um, their API. So they have, they've implemented rate limiting and they blogged about it. And in their blog posts, they said, you know, here are the different types of, of rate limiting that there are and here we use Redis to do the actual rate limiting, and here are the Redis, they use the Lua scripting capabilities of Redis to do it, right? So Redis get becomes your distributed uh, state store for rate limiting, and here are our scripts that we use in production to do rate limiting. So I, I, I brought those in and created a, a hopefully an API that, that makes a little sense. Um, to do rate limiting. So let's go ahead and 
add rate limiting to our Fortune API. Okay, so we're going to add a filter, F crest rate limiter on our configuration. So it's real easy to want to say you can have, you know, 10 requests, 100 requests a minute, right? It's really easy to say that. It's actually very hard to enforce that in a distributed manner, in a consistent way. So the algorithm, one of the most popular and uh, algorithms is the token bucket algorithm. Okay. Um, let's see. I, yeah, just to get a. So what happens is you describe how many tokens, those drops of water in the picture, what the rate of those is, how, how many tokens go into the bucket per second, and then you also describe um, how many, to how big a uh, bucket can you have, right, to store those tokens. Okay, so those are the two values that I'll be configuring. How, so that what happens is you can build up some burst capacity, right? If, if the tokens languish, um, then perhaps you get a burst of traffic, but you can still handle those because you have, you have some tokens saved up. Obviously, there's a limit to the number of tokens that can be saved in the bucket, right? So you can't have an infinite amount, but it gives you a little burst capacity. So the burst capacity is the uh, bucket size, and then how many tokens you get is, the, is kind of the refill. So that's what we're going to set here. So the, but for the demos, we're going to set them um, very short. Let's see. What happened here? Here's our All right, I'm going to go back and look. I'm going to cheat. Is that all right? Ah, right, okay. Uh, I'm, I see what I'm doing wrong. So we have a Redis rate limiter. That's what we're describing here. And then we're going to configure that guy. I was trying to configure the wrong object here. That's what was happening. Ah, still wrong. There we are. Ah, okay. So the replenish rate, how many tokens I get per second, and the burst capacity is how big is the bucket. Does that make sense? All right. Why am I complaining? Okay. So the other thing that rate limiting needs is to key off of something, right? In this case, it's our API token, which we're going to get out of a header, okay? So I have an interface called the key resolver. By default, if you have Spring Security on the class path, you can use get the principal out of uh, the request, right, and use that. So However, they've logged in already. In this case, we're going to create a key resolver. And we're just going to get a header. So if you look at the key resolver interface, excuse me, simply return a mono of a string for the key. So mono dot 
Turn. So you don't have to worry about what a mono is right now, but uh, exchange dot get request dot get headers get first x API key. Okay. All right. No errors, let's restart. Oh, there was an error. What do we, oh. Semicolons. Don't you like JavaScript? You don't need those. So we get to our terminal here. So if you learn nothing, I want you to learn about this tool here. Um, who here knows curl? Everybody, all right. So this is a tool called HTTPy. It is curl for humans. <laughs> I'm a human. You'll, you'll see why. So I, I do some shortcuts here. Um, V2 fortune, right, if I'm not mistaken. We are going to pass the host header is API dot, what was it, fortunes.io? Fortune or fortunes? Fortunes.io. Um, X dash API dash key. It doesn't really matter at this point since we're not doing any validation. Right, so beautiful, we get some colored output. If this were JSON, it would format it for us prettily. Pretty, pretty, I don't know, that's my word. All right, so now we wanna make sure we can, um, let's see, watch, dash, let's see. So we want to, first of all, only get the HTTP headers. I'll show you why in just a minute. Watch dash n zero dot one. So, as you can see, every other request or so, we get an HTTP 429 too many requests, showing that our we are making we're, we're exceeding our limits in 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 request rate limiting. Okay. So there we have it. I think we made it all the way through. Um, we could then retire, you know, we would have to make a change. The next step would be to make a change in our UI to point to slash v2, right? And then we could retire our monolith. Woohoo! Right? We could, we could throw away the app server. Um, so this is the gateway. Um, we might have time for a quick question. If anyone has one before, sure. So, so you're asking if we could automatically add services to the gateway? We certainly can. One of the features that we've added in the gateway is for um, the gateway to receive a list of services from discovery, and then you can look at the metadata and match an expression. So you could, in your metadata of your service, you could say edge equals true, right? So this is a service that I want to be exposed on the edge. And then you could have, also as part of that metadata, you could set the, uh, the path matching, right? So yes, you could have that automated by service discovery. Yep, here. How do you define a custom filter in a properties file? Um, grab me afterwards and I can, I can chat with you. It's a little more. Uh, I mean, basically, what you see here, right, is this, this name, host. You name your filter, and you would just reference it by that name in the, here, I'll sh I did not show you, let's see. Gateway. Go. Um, so here is a bunch of routes in in YAML, right? So so here's one, we're calling a built-in one called set status, but whether it's built-in or not, you would just reference it by its name 
instead of set, set, set status. Okay. All right. Oh, one more. Sure. We got time. You can, right? There, there are. Yes. Um, in fact, uh, I added that feature, and I have to. I'm in currently rewriting it because it was broken. But yes, you can. You can filter by that. You can also uh, use predicates based on the content. But basically, what happens is you have to buffer the whole thing, right? So you're memory constrained at that point. So as long as you understand the the limitations. Uh, absolutely. All right. Thanks. Any other questions? You can we can chat outside because my time's up and there's another speaker coming. <laughs> <laughs>